I hope you can hear me okay. Um, so it's really good to chair, chair this session. I was just um, able to join the previous session and listen to the conversation in the in the breakout group I was in. Um, and it's you know it's, it's clear that there's a lot of you know very valuable input and um, you know sort of practical stuff being being talked about. And hopefully we're we're sort of moving on to another aspect of that now in in retention and access. Um, we've got Imogen and Hugh with their papers and another discussion afterwards. Um, and as uh, before and, and as exhibited uh, in an Elizabeth session a minute ago, um, my job is really just to, to introduce our speakers and um, uh, do a two minute warning when there's two minutes left to go in, in the sessions. So uh, first up, we'll have uh, historical recording practices and their impact from Imogen. So it's Imogen Watts, um, who's uh, from Gloucestershire County Council. So uh, Imogen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adrian. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And I will share my screen. Hopefully then you'll be able to see my slides as well. OK, so my uh, involvement in Mirror came about due to a project we've been doing in Gloucestershire County Council for the past five and a half years now. It's quite a long running project. And that project is looking to improve the quality of the database entries on our records management database to help make it easier to find records and improve the access. Um, one of the things we touched upon in our breakout discussion was the difficulty in finding things and the time it then takes. So our project is really looking at trying to cut down on that stage and make it just that bit smoother and that bit quicker. From the project, we've become aware of a lot of historical practices that have an impact on the way we can release information now. So the way things are recorded in care files has changed a lot over time. A lot of the older files didn't seem to consider that the information might be released or might be read by anyone in future, uh, much less the child in themselves that they're writing about. So there are quite a few different issues that are related to that. A lot of the time, again, especially looking back to slightly older files, you get one file per family rather than one file per child. So you get multiple siblings covered in the same document, sometimes on the same page, sometimes in the same sentence. It will flick from talking about one child to another, to another, to another. And that can make it quite difficult to follow the thread of the story, um, aside from anything else. We get differences over time. We also get differences between different workers. Again, focusing on the older files, there wasn't necessarily the same guidance for how to record things. So people would do things their own way as people tend to. Then when you get duplication as well, you can get, I know, um, I think it was Jackie said, got you got loads and loads of duplication within the files you received. And that is the case in so many files. You can get the same document multiple times. You can get the same sentence multiple times within a document. And then when you look at um, longer running cases, you can get things duplicated across multiple files as well. You can go through a file and think, hang on, I've, I've seen all this. I know I've seen all this before. Then when you come to the early days of computer case management as well, people could copy and paste. So again, you get duplication, you get duplication across the entries for multiple siblings where that paragraph doesn't necessarily relate to them, but it was written about the family. So it's been copied, it's been pasted, it's in their file as well. You get streams of emails, people printing out the entire email trail and just chucking it in the file. So you've got that email trail, you get a bit further down the file, you've got it further back. The same email can come up so many times. And you come to outdated language as well. Um, we've mentioned jargon already, acronyms, things like that, that can be completely nonsensical. Even as uh, an information professional, you can try pulling stuff out and go, I have absolutely no idea what that means. Google doesn't help sometimes, it's just not documented. So that is a real problem. But as well, you get language that relates to societal views at the time so you can get descriptions of children's appearances that are quite judgmental in what they're wearing or how they they were turned out a hairstyle they've chosen things like that 
and of course you can get things um terminology that through modernize is racist or offensive and that is a problem in itself of course and then you come to things you can't even read you get handwriting that you can't work out what it says at all you get fax pages from the 90s where we had lovely heat sensitive paper that have all faded and you just can't can't work out what it says so the impact that these issues have on data protection considerations and how we can release things what we can release we'd like to release as much as we can i mean i know that's not true of all organizations it's certainly true of us we would like to release as much as possible we get restricted by what's in the files how it's in the files and by trying to to stay within the law of course as well it also affects retention if we've got files covering multiple siblings if one child was in care others weren't if one child was adopted and others weren't under the current legislation that can be the difference between keeping a file for 25 75 or 100 years and if it's not clear in the file we won't necessarily know that if an early volume of a file no children have been in care or adopted and then later on they were if we don't know the link between those files some may get destroyed potentially too early then in terms of inf information release there's uh, considerations of what's known as third party information so if it relates to a different person so when we look at siblings or parents and things like that it can take time to gather extra information to try to work out what someone already knows if they already know things about their siblings and their parents we can release that and don't have to worry about redacting there's differences across various organizations there's inconsistencies there's also what we have to consider is what's known as the potential for harm and distress and this can be so difficult to establish what could distress me can be entirely different from what might distress someone else um, there might be something that is in a file that can seem like it could be distressing or harmful but actually it's something that person's already aware of so there would be no potential harm in releasing that but without knowing that background information sometimes an organization has to take a risk averse approach um, rightly or wrongly then we've heard as well about the time that it takes to get responses when you've asked for your information and part of the problem with that is the time it takes just to sift through the file going through one file some of them are sort of this thick genuinely we've got quite a few that are that thick and just working through that going through taking out duplicates where we can trying to decipher the illegible stuff it just it does all take time unfortunately and the other difficulty with the information that's hard to read is that it's an unknown risk if we release it we might not be able to read it you might know that person's handwriting and actually you might instantly know what it says it's it's a slim risk but it is still a risk that we have to consider and where it's things like the fax pages if we can't read it you can't read it we have to weigh up whether there's any point in giving you that information if it's just going to appear as a blank page once it gets to you then we also now have to consider uh, records that are created in a digital format as most care records are now created in databases we have to make sure they will remain accessible for the next 10 20 50 or 100 years so with paper we know we can get it out of a box and other than the fax paper it should still be readable whereas we need to be more careful with the binary ones and zeros so we need to make sure there are things like an agreed open format for exporting at the point where records are created so essentially that will enable us to transfer records from one system to the next so systems about, uh, two minutes to go sorry Imogen. okay that's all right i think i'm about on track um most systems only last about 10 years so we need to make sure that records could be moved out at that point and into the next one if a child moves from one local authority to another we need to be able to transfer that so their story continues and to be able to move older records closed records into some form of digital preservation system so rather than having closed cases slowing down the active system putting them somewhere where they can be safe and they can be found but without impacting on current things 
we need to be able to prove that records are authentic and haven't been tampered with. So there are various technical things we can do with those. And then making sure that records can actually be understood by humans. So we can preserve all the ones and zeros, but if that's all you're getting out of it, it doesn't mean anything to us. It needs to be actually understandable. So what we can do in the future to try to make tomorrow's information release better than yesterday's, a lot of it comes down to open communication. So around that requesting and releasing information stage, the more communication we can have between the organisations and the individuals to establish what's already known, what might or might not be harmful or distressing, and try to open those channels to then be able to release much more. Um, having guidance endorsed by the ICO on more sensitive redaction, more open redaction as well, so that organisations can perhaps feel freer to, to take more risks rather than just having a klaxon in the back of their minds going, this could cost a lot of money to the organisation if I get this wrong, um, which again, shouldn't necessarily be the focus, but for a lot of organisations, it, it is. Having routine sharing as part of practice, so that openness through a child's journey, so you don't necessarily have to ask for your records as an adult you've already seen it you already know it keeping that conversation going and child-centered recording as well so focusing on the child's perspective and including their views again that openness and transparency as we go through as well thank you for Just have a or have a bit of a ch general chat with imogen to follow yeah. up on any issues whilst we wait for you to well, the, the, I, I, I turn the one, the, the one i uh, one i wrote down imogen um was around about obviously you know uh, I, I represent archives and records association on this um, the mirror project and and you know what can what can we do to kind of help share this kind of best practice that you've described in your in your presentation it's a very good question um we've done little bits to to try to share what we're doing so we had a conference way back when it was October 2017 which is now definitely getting getting quite a way back in time um, where we invited people to Gloucester and people did come from a lot of local authorities and we shared what we were doing and how we were doing it and why we we're doing it um, that sort of thing is potentially something we could whether it would be a talk at some other conference mm -hmm. um, something that Ara is doing as well whether we can contribute to something like that mm -hmm. um, yeah we've we've done articles on other things so happy to do anything to spread the word that would be useful a, a good reprise on the on the train yeah, front. I'll, brilliant I'll, thanks Imogen. um hugh i I'll, think you have re okay i'll i'll fire away then so uh, and i'll put on my best scottish accent which means this whole thing will take about 10 seconds to get through so that'll be cool for everybody um I want to thank everybody for inviting me to participate in this event today. It's been a very important and it's a very, very moving event. So I'm really pleased to be participating in it. Some of you will know um, uh, the Public Record Scotland that it had its beginning as in a 2007 report on childcare provision in Scotland, which highlighted uh, records management failures that had serious consequences for the care experience. Uh, but for those that don't know, oh, success. Thank you very much. That's it. You can go ahead. I've got them now. You just have to tell me when you need me to move to the next slide. OK, by the way, take, take me to the next slide, please, Elizabeth. And um, yeah, so for those of you who don't know about the Public Records Scotland Act, I'll give you a tiny bit of a background. It was the first piece of public records legislation passed in Scotland in over 70 years when it received royal assent in 2011. And that's important to know because it may tell us something about where records, public records, come on the list of political, if not societal, um, priorities. It requires specific things of public authorities, but principally it requires them to have their records management arrangements agreed by the keeper of the records of Scotland. It designates records being created and managed in the private and voluntary sector as public for the purposes of legislation, and I'll say a wee bit more about that in a, in a minute. The broader aim of the legislation is to change the culture. And we've heard quite a lot actually over the past couple of days about the culture. And its aim is to change the culture around public records to better protect the rights of Scotland citizens, particularly the rights of the care experience. Next slide, please, Elizabeth. The Shaw report, or the 2007 report rather, was the historical abuse systemic review of the Shaw report that reviewed the systems that should have been in place in Scotland's childcare sector between the period 
1950 to 1995, and it did so against the backdrop of claims of physical, emotional and sexual abuse suffered by vulnerable young people who relied on residential care for their well-being. Next slide, please. Shaw recorded how he himself was denied access to records vital to his review. They couldn't be found or they had been erroneously destroyed. He concluded that senior managers in public and non-public sector had failed to value the records that they and their staff were routinely creating. Records were, he said, sometimes viewed as a byproduct of the service with little value beyond that, either as a vital, as vital personal information or as a business asset or as having enduring value for research purposes. Records and information is better or are better regulated now, there's no doubt about that. But has how we value information changed? Do public servants generally now invest intellectually in the information that they routinely create? Do we understand the importance of the records that we create? Yes, possibly, maybe. Uh, and certainly, I think where our social work services and social work colleagues are involved, that's very true. But Jackie uh, McCartney's uh, very moving retelling of her experience this morning reminds us of the challenges that exist. And next slide, please. Some of these headlines are recent and they're not hard to find. Disasters continue to happen. And when they do, they undermine the rights of individuals and communities. We need to change the culture around public sector information because only uh, when we achieve this can we have any real confidence, in my view, that we will see an end to these kinds of headlines. But that's not going to happen overnight. And Scottish ministers in passing the legislation wanted swifter, tangible outcomes with regard to care records specifically. So they used the act to define a public record broadly. Next slide, please. Section three of the Act says that public records are those created by and on behalf of an authority in carrying out its functions. And this means that the records that are being created by private and voluntary bodies under contract to a public authority to deliver a public function are public and they must be managed in line with the commissioning authority's obligations under the legislation. This is a powerful clause. For the first time ever in the UK, we have a piece of public sector legislation that reaches out of the public sector and into the private and the voluntary sectors to protect public records. And why not? If a private or a voluntary body is delivering a public function and being paid from the public first, first, why shouldn't it be held publicly accountable? But we need to make this work and it's not easy. Next slide, please. And the challenge that we face is and the major challenge that we face is that the Act does not name third party providers as having to comply with its requirements. Instead, it requires the named authorities to satisfy the keeper that public records being created on their behalf under contract can be properly managed by the provider. That provision puts third party providers at arm's length to the legislation but they remain genuinely fearful of what being this close to this legislation might mean for them. They fear, for example, that by being identified as creators and managers of public records, they would be dragged into the world of freedom of information with all the attendant costs and levels of scrutiny that that would bring. Next slide, please. To help embed this requirement under the Act, the Keeper produced guidance for authorities and for third parties, and that was a bit of a trial, I have to say. Records management draft clauses were developed to provide colleagues with generic statements on records obligations that can be placed into contracts or procurement documentation. And there are a contractor's guidance, which is a self-assessment tool effectively, which allows contractors to assess whether they have the records management infrastructure in place to meet a public authority's requirements before they enter into the contract competition. And mindful of our third party colleagues' concerns, the Keeper published this guidance to the website of the Scottish Council and Archives, rather than the National Records of Scotland, to put further distance between the guidance and government. Fair enough, I suppose. But eight years on, we need to assess how well this is working, if it's working. We brought together colleagues just last week to begin this process and we plan with some care and with some sensitivity 
to draw on the experience of third party providers in the future. Last week's meeting heard from a colleague, Joanne Wisher, who's the archivist at CMAB, which is a residential primary school for children with severe social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. Her account of CMAB's experience in liaising with public authorities over the public records that they create on their behalf didn't fill us with confidence. Joanne's experience will be added to others that we will hear from over the coming months, and we will be using this to help deliver collaborative solutions, hopefully. We have a long way to go. Next slide, please. However, two wonderful things have happened since the Act came into force in 2013. Firstly, Section 3, this thing that we've just been speaking about, placing an indirect duty on third party providers, has been in operation for all of that time and the sky has not fallen in. Secondly, and this is truly remarkable, the Keeper has been approached directly by third party providers seeking records management advice and guidance. Organisations that are not covered by the legislation, organisations that were very, very keen not to be associated with it, organisations that we have been careful not to engage with, are voluntarily approaching us for help. And some, we understand, are following the steps that are being prepared for public authorities to help manage their own records. This is very, very encouraging. And that's a good basis upon which to start changing the culture. Next slide, please. But as I've got about uh, two managers, minutes to go, Hugh. Thank you, Adrian. But as archivists and records managers, we know it's a bit more than that. Ensuring the records created by third parties on behalf of public bodies are properly managed is about protecting rights individual and societal rights, and it's about safeguarding our democracy. It actually doesn't get any more important than that. I've known Chris Daly for some time. Chris Daly was the guy who lodged the petition at the Scottish Parliament in 2002, demanding an apology from the Scottish Government for the treatment that he and others had received at the hands of Scotland's care service. Um, and I know that Chris grew to be a man in his mid-40s, thinking that his mum and dad didn't love him that they had abandoned them to a life of neglect and abuse in our care system. And there was a file that had postcards and letters and birthday cards on it, the evidence that that was not the case. And it explained to some extent why he was in the situation he was in. It clearly demonstrated that his mum and dad loved him. But he didn't get this file until 2002. I heard Neve McDade, Professor of Forensic Science and Director of Research at the University of Dundee speak recently about how critical it is for forensic evidence to be properly created, properly stored, properly managed, properly accessed, properly audited, to support the vitally important work of the justice system in this country because it underpins our democracy. Is it not true that the records that are created by those caring for vulnerable people in our society, young and old, are equally important? Public servants need to understand the context, and I include myself in this, in which we create records. We need to know that we're creating the correct records and that we're looking after them properly. Most of all, we need to care, and that's what changing the culture is all about. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so, so much, Hugh. Um, so have we got time for a quick round of questions or do we want to go straight to the uh, general discussion? Um, you could probably do one question, Adrian, but then I think we should move pretty quickly sure, to the breakout no groups. No Thank problem. you. Um, uh, are there any uh, hands or questions? Or would you like me to pose one? Um, well, I can, I can have a pose. The, the sort of thought that really occurred to me listening to the to the two together there um there's there's sort of very much a piece around how the individual practice of of those who have records in, in their care or you know working to make them available um kind of really makes a difference in both situations so you know sort of thinking about Imogen's best practice and sharing that you know others taking that on it would it would help and and Likewise, as, as you was describing, the way the sort of practice has filtered from official guidance and public bodies into the the the, the individual practice of those working in third party organisations also sort of makes a difference. And I wonder whether Imogen and who do you want to comment on that? Have I have I sort of read that read across correct? Is that is that what you're seeing? 
Um, yeah, I think if I can come in first, I mean, I think I'm not sure I'm going to answer this directly, but I, I certainly see um, uh, both sides of the coin. We deal with lots and lots of public authorities in Scotland, 270 of named under legislation, um, which is not all the public authorities, but it's the ones which are covered by the Act. Um, and we see varying levels of, of um, performance around records and information governance. Some are very, very good and some are not. Um, uh, so there's a huge need for appropriate advice and guidance there. And people, uh, in my experience, are very keen to help deliver that, to help co-produce it, to use it, to make things better. That's certainly the case we are seeing when we're speaking to the converted, I know, because we're speaking to our records and information governance colleagues. But we do see that as well higher up the food chain within these organisations. And that's very encouraging. What's extremely encouraging, I think, is that this advice and guidance that we are creating principally for the public sector, is being used by others in the private and voluntary and charitable sectors. And that's really very encouraging. And we need to make more of that. We have this challenge around being able to engage with third party uh, uh, providers because they're very concerned about their own legal situations. Um, but we need to do it because uh, if we're going to get this right, everybody needs to speak. It's pointless that we speak to ourselves and we leave a very critical group out of this. But we do see signs that they are accepting of this, and we do see signs that they are grabbing at the, the advice and guidance that we're able to produce, and we look to do more of that in the future. No, thank, thanks, you. Imogen, did you want to comment? Um, I think the main thing for me, I always feel the need when we're kind of held up as beacons of good practice, I feel the need to emphasise that it, we're not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. We're not there yet. We've what we've done that feels quite radical is we've looked at the way things were done and identified that a lot of this wasn't great. So we're working to fix the, oh, sorry if anyone got a little ping then from my laptop. Um, we're working to fix the past and trying to improve the present and the future, but it's very much a, a work in progress and a journey that we're on. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't want anyone to think that we're we're there and doing all the things perfectly and wonderfully. We're trying to and we're getting there. <laughs> it's very much a journey. And yeah, I, I completely agree with everything that Hugh was saying as well. Thanks, thanks very much, Imogen. Uh, Elizabeth, back to you. That's fantastic. So thanks very much, Adrian.